We're live with Padma Sri Warrior, CEO and founder of Fable. It's awesome to have you here, Padma. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm excited to dive in. Um, you've had quite a bit of, uh, you know, long, extensive experience in technology and leadership roles um, from electric autonomous vehicles um, to digital book clubs for mental health. Um, so I'm excited to learn from you and and hear you know what's most exciting for you right now. But maybe we could just start with a quick um, bio and intro on yourself and what you're building today with Fable. Yeah. So yeah, as you mentioned, I've had a long career in uh, technology. I'm uh, an engineer by training. Um, so yeah, I've been in the tech industry for building everything from semiconductors to mobile devices to networking to cars and, and now Fable. Uh, prior to starting Fable, I was the founding CEO for a company uh, that's a subsidiary of a parent Chinese company called Neo, And that's where I was building electric cars. And before that, I served as the chief technology and strategy officer at Cisco and led uh, worldwide engineering uh, for Cisco. Uh, Fable, just to bring everyone up to speed if you haven't heard about us, is essentially a social platform for stories. So whether we are reading stories or listening to stories or watching stories, um, it's a community that reads together, discusses together, and shares that experience of being um, being interested in stories along with your with your friends. And so uh, what most people don't know is uh, stories and reading stories, especially uh, reading books and reading short stories, reading poetries, all these things helps us with our mental wellness. And there's a lot of science now that talks about how when we read a story, it's much more effective in terms of improving our cognitive abilities, more effective than playing a game of chess or being outside uh, from a mental wellness point of view. So that's what we position Fable for is uh, basically think of it as a platform for book clubs at internet scale. Um, and over time, it just it doesn't need to be just a book club. You can discuss an article, you can discuss a podcast, you can discuss any way you're consuming the story inside your group. That's what we're building. Yeah, I've always thought, you know, it's something that I've even personally struggled with is like note taking, uh, discussing different things I'm reading on the internet. Like we live in this world of, you know, there's there's so much to consume, um, but integrating what we're learning from that, from what we're reading and, and organizing it is is a pretty important thing and I think it can really push us forward. How did you come up with the idea for Fable? Yeah, and so when I left Neo, I was interested in doing something more broadly in the wellness space. I feel like in my career, I've done everything from building chips that went into many, many devices, then you know, moving up the system stack, if you will, to uh, building cell, cell phones and, and cellular infrastructure, to building networking at Cisco, to data center security, literally done everything. And I wanted to really focus in the wellness space. And so I was looking at, and there's now actually incredible amount of data that points out to how mental wellness is becoming a big challenge for all of us. Things like anxiety, stress, depression, loneliness, feeling burnt out, we all go through that, right? Like as long as we are human, we all have this. And so uh, helping people making, taking care of their mental wealth wellness a priority in our day-to-day -day activities and then giving them a fun way to do it. So my thesis is that 10 years from now, mental wellness will mean a lot more than therapy, right? Like mm -hmm. just, just like physical fitness is now today, no longer just going to the gym and pumping weights. It can it can be you jam, lipping, listening to hip hop music and working out, or it can be Bombay jam, listening to Bollywood music and working out. Literally, there is something for everyone to take care of a physical wellness. Uh, similarly, 10 years from now, there'll be lots of lots and lots of inclusive um, solutions for mental wellness. And so that was sort of my uh, passion and motivation. And as you pointed out, when we are reading something, uh, it's very interesting. We take notes. We have a certain interpretation of what we are reading. But it's always amazing to hear somebody else's in interpretation, right? And then we learn from each other when we are reading together. And so that's a social platform we are building. Uh, when did wellness um, 
start to show up in your life? Is it something that you grew up with? Is it something that you struggled with yourself? How, how did it make its way to be to, to today where it's, it's something that you want to, you know, dedicate your career to or your, your time to? Yeah, no, definitely. I think for me, uh, mental wellness, I think wellness, again, broadly, if you think about wellness, there's physical wellness, there's nutrition, there's mental wellness, right? Like oftentimes, we over rotate on one and neglect the other two, we go on these diet kicks and forget about exercising, forget about mental wellness, or we do the we work out so much, we are forgetting to eat healthy, and, and take care of mental wellness, mental wellness for many of us comes last, right? Because we don't realize it's an issue until it becomes an issue. Um, and so it's sort of like, reversing that and helping people making this a daily priority. I think I realized that it's important to have a balance between all three. When I when my son was born, um, he's now an adult, but when he was a baby, I was working and, and trying to be a mom and you know take care of my family, sort of like everything we all juggle, many, many things. I was getting completely overwhelmed and you know I would always feel guilty no matter what I did. And so it's sort of like this guilt was what I mm. suffered from. It didn't matter what decision I was making. If I was working, I would feel guilty. I was a terrible mom and I wasn't taking care of my newborn. And if I stayed home, I would feel guilty. I wasn't working as hard. Um, and so I think it's sort of like this started to cause anxiety for me and I needed a, something to calm me down. And so I initially started meditating. I still meditate every day. Um, but in, edit in addition to meditation, which is hard, you know, for me, for many of us who work in the tech industry, we're hyperactive individuals and, you know, we tend to be super active. Difficult for me to just sit still and, and be calm and meditate. Uh, but what helped me was reading actually I would read a lot and I grew up in India and uh, growing up when I was a little kid the only form of entertainment I had was books so I was an obsessive reader and I kind of rediscovered the joy and the power of healing with reading um, when I would say my son was a newborn and I was like overcome with uh, mm -hmm. overwhelmed with all the things I had to deal with in life work and family and newborn child being a mom all these things um, I think that was sort of maybe my trigger, but then of course I started Fable 20 years later. Um, it was when I felt like it's time now to build a social platform dedicated for social reading. Yeah, diving maybe a little into your own reading practice for you know wellness or mental health. Um, are there any books that come to mind, um, whether books that you've gifted the most or books that, you know, you think back to that have less left a lasting impact on your life there's so many i think books really i mean people always ask me did i have a mentor in my life and my career i mean the biggest mentors i've had are actually books and stories um mm -hmm. you know i can because when i read a book it makes me pause and think and and words move me they challenge me um I think most recent books I've read that I felt like had a profound impact on me. Uh, we have a book club on Fable that's led by Levar Burton. And in Levar Burton's book club, you know, I read with him along with, with many others. Um, he picked uh, his first book we read is a book by James Baldwin called Go Tell It on the Mountain. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I read that book and really moved me. And I think had a it had so much direct effect in what we are feeling now as a society with racial injustice, social injustice, all the differences that divide us versus looking for commonality that brings us. So that I would say more recently had mm -hmm. had a great impact on me. The other book is a book called The, the Ministry of the Future. It's a uh, climate fiction and uh, the author- Clim Climate fiction? Climate fiction, yeah. So it's okay. a, a science fiction author, but it talks about climate change and how it mm. affects the earth. Uh, that is, it's actually a very date. There's a lot of data in that book. And that book made me, I mean, of course we all know about climate change and know things are happening, but he projects a future that is so dystopic, how our world actually changes. It makes it very personal when you read this, like to think that this could be our future. This could be where we end up if we don't change our behaviors today. Um, that's another book I would say that really had a profound impact. Uh, there's just so many books. I just am uh, reading another book by Octavia Butler. Um, it's called Parable of the Sower. 
uh, again, another uh, uh, sci-fi book, but she wrote this book in the 90s. But if you read this book, you feel like she's telling the story of what's happening now as we live it. Um, I would say those are the three books that more recently have had a big impact on me. Amazing. And then how about looking to your life as a whole and maybe, you know, whether it's coming of age or getting into your career, uh, maybe leaving India, um, whether it's books that had a profound impact on your evolution as a human being, um, or maybe even books that you've revisited uh, time and time again, because of, you know, every time you come back to it, it kind of teaches you a little bit of something different. Are there any top yeah. that come to mind? There are several. I mean, I think, you know, we all read for different reasons, right? Like some books shape us who we are, uh, make us pause and think and rethink our own assumptions. Books are actually very powerful for that. One such book is The Alchemist by Paula Coelho. Mm -hmm. I love that book. I think when I first read it, I read it as a tale, um, you know, but then I reread, I've probably read that book three, four times. The second time I read it was like, oh, it's more of a coming of age story. And the third time I read it, I was like, oh, there's a lot of wisdom. He's searching for wisdom. He's searching for truth, searching for his own identity. Sort of like each time you discover something interesting. I would say that in terms of introspection and retrospection about ourselves, uh, that book has had a big influence on me. I'm rereading Dune now, which is a fun read. Uh, you know, I read Dune 20 years ago, and I'm now reading it again. Um, I'm, I'm a big probably can tell I'm a big sci-fi fantasy fiction fan. Um, you know, I'm anticipating the new Dune movie coming out. And so I want to read the book again. A very complex world that Frank Herbert, the author, creates. Um, and, you know, there's been lots of interpretations of what the Dune, where it's set, you know, where is Dune? Is it in the Middle East or is it a fictional world? So when you, I'm reading it actually for the third time now because there's so many characters and the whole world building is fascinating. Um, and trying to, again, look at it deeper. When you read a book for the second time, sometimes you peel you peel the different layers yeah. away. Um, so that's another book that's a super fun book, but a very big, thick book that I'm reading in a sci-fi book club on Fable. Cool. Um, I'm curious to switch gears a little bit. You know, you're, uh, this is the first company that you've officially founded, but you were C CEO of, of um, Neo. Um, what did it look like for you to like start this company? So you have this idea, you leave Neo. Um, what did you do in terms of getting, getting started? Uh, and then where are y'all today? Yeah, so for the first, after I left Neo for the first six months, I knew I wanted to do something in the wellness space. Okay. Uh, I didn't know exactly what that was. And I was looking for what's a big problem out there. I'm a big believer, I think for other founders, maybe listening to this, or if you're thinking of starting a company, I'm a big believer that if you have a big problem, that's a persistent problem and have a simple solution, it's, it's easy to make a big business out of it, right? Like if the solution is a moonshot, then it's very hard to implement. That requires a lot of capital. Um, or if the problem is something that's temporary, again, the solution, it won't be a sustaining business. Um, so that's sort of where I started. I, want, I knew I was very passionate about wellness. I felt like I'm ready to do something that was much more of a consumer-oriented solution this time. Um, I was always a big fan of social products, but I always felt social products lacked the um, lacked this I mean there were social media and social networks but very few products had a community concept like how do you build a community on a digital platform and bring people that share interests together to do that activity together yeah. um, so I kind of had both these thesis in mind um, and then I literally worked on it myself for the first six months I did a ton of research met a bunch of other founders in the space um, you know looked at other social kind of platforms that exist for content out there convinced myself um, initially because I, I'm also before starting Fable I was an active angel investor so I would always look for founders pitches and you know like try to help them figure out is there differentiation here is there a market here and so mm. I was sort of like testing this with myself um, so I spent six six to seven months working on it by myself and then I started to uh, I decided to start a company and my first employee was an iOS developer and so it was like him and I and we were just you know, working on things together, working on building a prototype, 
So I went from, as you know, leading a team of 26,000 engineers at, at Cisco. Um, this was a huge change for me, like to say, okay, now I am the engineer as well as the CEO and founder. I'm everything and, you know, work with one other person. And I uh, decided to incorporate the company and started Fable there. Um, uh, it's scary to be a founder. I think um, every founder goes through that, right? Like, because yeah. you have a lot of self-confidence and you have to be super passionate about your value proposition and what you're building. Yeah, well, it sounds like you went about it in a in the in the right way. And I I think even looking back, you know, there's folks in our community that are working at companies and might be thinking about you know starting their own companies. Um, one day, um, how, when you, when you reflect back on your, on your career trajectory, you know, maybe what were the highlights or the lessons learned that propelled you forward to this position where you are today, whether it's, you know, leadership and being a CTO, being a CEO, being a founder, what was it along that journey that like got you here? Yeah, I think first of all, realizing that when you're building a product, whether it's in a big company or as a startup, really focusing on solving a problem that exists, right? Like I think sometimes, especially in big companies, we develop technologies that are looking for a solution. And so those are great, like in a big company, com big companies should do that. But in a startup, you don't have that luxury. You have to be super focused on um, what I, is, is what I'm working on going to solve a problem for someone and, and remove this friction that they have in day-to-day -day experiences. I think that's super important. Um, from, a, from a leadership perspective, I think what helped me propel forward is taking risk. Even in big companies, if you kind of look at my career, I've always been a risk taker. I've changed industries many, many times. I've gone from building networking at Cisco to building cars. And people thought I was completely insane doing that. Like I went to work for a China-based startup and people thought I was crazy leaving a big job at Cisco, C-level job, third biggest job in the company to go work at a Chinese startup that was insane, people thought. But I learned so much from that experience. I think that ability to take risks and learn different industries, learn different things, um, adds to your toolkit, as if, if you will, right? Like it's not just yeah. like learning a new area, but it also stretches you as a leader, as an individual. Um, I think those two things, like being super focused on what problem am I solving and being able to take risks uh, and you know, doing different things, whatever that is, you know, and of course that level of comfort and risk taking varies for each individual, but knowing your personal situation, assessing that and being able to take risks. I think oftentimes people get very comfortable where they're at and yeah. we don't push ourselves to, to go take that leap of faith. So maybe two questions. What was, is there one big risk that you, you took, uh, early on that you still remember that was maybe acted as an inflection point of, okay, I, I took the risk. It's scary, but on the other side, there's, you know, X or, or X or Y reward. Um, what got you from, what got you okay with taking risks? Yeah, I would say my very first risk I took was going from being an engineer to a manager, right? Like okay. that is very early in my career, I was in my 20s. I had no idea what it means to lead a, lead people. Um, you know, I was a good engineer. And like back, you know, I think we still do this. We promote good engineers to become managers, whether they really want it or not. And so I was one of those people that got promoted <laughs> to become a manager. And suddenly I was like managing four or five engineers. And I had no idea what it meant to lead people. As engineers, you know, we all solve problems. So I was a problem solver. As an you know, great engineer, solve problems. We are very resourceful in figuring out how to solve problems. But I think the mistake I made in my very first experience as a leader of people was to solve problems for them. Like, you know, I would take over mm -hmm. and tell them what to do. Um, and, you, you know, when you do that, it's actually a bad thing because people stop 
thinking for themselves because they know Padma is going to tell us what to do anyway. Why bother? And so I think it was very quickly a humbling experience and a learning experience that as a leader, one of the biggest things you have to do is inspire others to do great things, not necessarily micromanage them. Um, but that was a big risk. It turned out to be actually the best thing in my career because, you know, I am today. My superpower is building teams and leading people. Um, I would say I would say that is what I'm really amazed, amazingly good at, and so I think that was my very first experience of becoming a manager. And probably first few months, I realized very quickly what it means to be an individual contributor is very different from leading people and uh, learning that skill and honing that skill, continuing to hone that skill is. Uh, people are really difficult to manage, right? Like each one of us is very different, and so. To be a leader inside a company, and you know whether it's leading a team of five people or leading a team of twenty thousand people, complexity-wise, it's the same because you have to understand why someone's doing what they're doing and help them think about things in a different way and help them achieve their greatest potential. Um, and getting satisfaction from that is very different from you going and tinkering with things and and building great products. Um, so yeah, I would say that's probably the biggest risk I took, which which paid off very well for me. And then and then maybe the the risk taking feature the, or, or or skill that you that you've had is that something that uh, that were your parents risk takers, or is that something that you were that you grew up with, or is it something that you saw in somebody else that you're like, okay, I'm going to do that. How did that even come to Yeah, be? no, I, I mean, I think I was always a little bit of a rebel. Like, you know, I mean, okay. I grew up in a very protected family in India. When I was growing up, they were Where in India. In, I grew up in Southern India. near Southern India. And I went to school in Delhi to okay. IIT, Delhi, which is a very, very competitive, very, very high tech. Um, you may have heard of IIT, yeah, it's sort of yeah. very intense technical school. Uh, there were basically no women at that time who did engineering. That was my first big risk was to decide to be an engineer <laughs> and then move from southern India to Delhi. I didn't speak Hindi. It's like, you know, India, they, each state, they speak a different language. So all of a sudden, I was leaving my sheltered home in southern India and I was in Delhi at IIT. Um, went to IIT thinking I was the smartest person on the planet and realized like within a nanosecond, I wasn't. There's just so many smart people out there. Um, you know, and there were five women in a class of 250. So it was sort wow. of like, it was daunting and overwhelming and scary. And I called my dad and said, I want to come home. And he told me, no, you can't come home. You've chosen this path. It's up to you to make this a success. It's probably the best advice he gave me at the time. I was really mad at my dad for telling me that. Um, you know, I was 16 years old, but I uh, IIT was the best thing that happened to me. I learned to be independent. I learned how important for women in tech to support each other and have this community because there was five of us, like I was saying, and we stuck together um, and so a lot of learning from that experience but that was probably the biggest risk I took uh, in my life and uh, since then I've been uh, I, I would say I've been always had this non-traditional career path that's really amazing um, <laughs> you know since then there has been a lot of progress but we still have a long way to go, long um, way to go. what kind of you know, if you if you were talking maybe to yourself and other folk, you know, other women, your your age in a similar position, maybe still in India, or other folks that are, you know, part of minority groups, marginalized communities that are, you know, looking to propel themselves forward, and you had to give them some level of advice around risk taking, um, or risk tolerance. What would that be? Yeah, I would say be confident in yourself, self-confident. Um, I think being being clear on what you know, what you don't know, where you need help um, is the second thing. I think, you know, once you should be self-confident, but should also be self-aware mm. and, and reaching out to other people who will help you in areas that you're not that great at, you know, finding uh, that help and asking for that help. And the third thing I would say is super important and helped me a great deal is belonging to a community of people that will help you, right? Like this is part of the reason why I'm starting Fable is communities have an intense 
in, incredible amount of power to boost us up, right? Like they they hold you up, they push you up. Um, in my case, when I was sort of like I was saying, when I was a young student at IIT, it was sort of like my other women in my class that we were a community together. Um, you know, when I started working, when I went to Cornell, I went to Cornell University for my graduate school. Again, it was a group of women engineers we stuck together. Sort of like I think communities, it's really important. So finding that community that will help you is um, important. Of course, for me, it was reading. Reading was always inspiring. I used to read books about women that accomplished great things. And by the way, on Fable, I now have a book club called the Fierce Females Book Club, where we read about strong female characters. Awesome. Um, and so, uh, yeah, all these things, I think, shape who you are. And this is one way you sort of like surround yourself with that community that helps you. Speaking of strong uh, woman characters, as well as maybe strong characters in general, um, you know, you spoke a little bit about uh, one of the the first big risks you took was going from being a an engineer to a manager, and now you know you fat you fast forward to having led different teams uh, between Cisco and, uh, and Neo, um, and now with Fable, thinking about recruiting talent. Um, the the war for talent is something that's that's real. Um, the landscape for talent has changed. Many of us are still working from home. Um, as, as a founder CEO, how do you think about building your team? Like, take the lessons that you've learned to now build your team at a start at a high growth startup. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is super important to me. First of all, as the founder, especially in a young company, you have to invest your power and your time in recruiting talent, right? Like people are coming to work with you um, because you're still young as a company. You know, they don't know the company. It's not like you're a big brand company that they're coming to work for that big brand. They're coming to work with you as, as the leader. And so you have to make it personal. You have to make it your job. I screen all the candidates. I reach out to people. Sometimes I get messages. I reach out to people on LinkedIn and I get messages. Is it really Padma or is it somebody using her account? <laughs> um, I was back. I was like, no, it's really me. I'm actually, I go on LinkedIn and I reach out to people. Um, and so you have to make it your business, right? Like it, it, it's the most important thing you would do as a founder and CEO. By the way, I did this at Cisco too. One of the most important things you would do as a C-level executive, I did it at Neo as well, is to recruit that talent. What I look for though, and this, this may be contrary to popular opinion too, I never... Look, I always tell people I'm not talking to you for your experience. I'm talking to you for your expertise. And there's a big difference. Um, your experience means people who come with a lot of experience will tend to extrapolate from that experience. I did this at my previous company. Therefore, I want to do the same thing at this company. Uh, many of the things you do in your career at previous companies are not necessarily transferable one-on-one -on -one to, to your current company. And so usually I will, that's to me a red flag when people say that. Um, I, I tend to caution people, not necessarily to talk about it that way, but talk about if you were given this problem, how will you solve it based on your experience? Mm. Use your expertise, not necessarily your experience, because that shows me your growth. You have a growth mindset, you're a you know, lifelong learner. You want to learn things. And, and so from all of our experiences, we capture things that go into our expertise basket. And we now need to figure out how to apply that expert expertise in a different context. Um, those are the kinds of people I look for. And I feel like those are the kinds of people that are very fungible that can go from company to company, especially if we are hiring someone from a big company. What happens in big companies and including my own experience being in a big company is as you progress up, you figure out how to be successful in that company right? Um, you know, how to work the politics, how do you position your ideas, how do you get the resources you want in the context of that particular company? That may be very different in a different company. And a lot, a lot of those skills are not transferable. And so I tend to tend to be very careful not to over rotate on people's experience, but focus on their expertise. Mm. Do you think, you know, as you think about like, um, maybe uh, talent getting better in this new, you know, in 2021, 2022, is it, how, what do you think about the balance between 
people being self-motivated to propel themselves forward and up and upskill versus the company's responsibility to invest in their people's development? Yeah, I think both are important, I think. Uh, but I think what is changing, and I think in some ways, all of us working in startups are the beneficiaries of this movement. People are now much more aware and I think count as an important factor in what they're looking for in the, in the role is the mission of the company, right? Like, what is this company's purpose? Is it going to help human beings at scale? I think this is becoming much more of a factor than uh, 10, 20 years ago, right? Like 10, 20 years ago, stability of the job, the paycheck, the location, these things mattered a lot. Like I want to be in the Bay Area, so I'm looking for a company in the Bay Area. Or I want to be in SoCal, so I'll look for a company there. I think it definitely these days, location doesn't matter. You know, I built a company, we're now 25 people, we're distributed our people everywhere in the US and outside of the US. And so literally we've proven in the last two years, we could work and be productive no matter where we are. Um, and so location is no longer important, right? Like, and, and, and people are realizing in addition to monetary compensation, there's other things that are fulfilling to us as human beings, mission being one of them. Uh, so I think those are the types of things that are important. So in that context, upskilling yourself and having the self-motivation, if you're going to be in a distributed team, not in a physical office, it's super important to have the self-motivation to yeah. perform, right? Like no one's watching you. You know, I'm trusting all of my team to deliver. And, you know, I don't know if they're in front of their computers all day long or not and I don't need to watch them I know mm -hmm. if they're self-motivated they will actually we'll actually push ourselves even more so that's important but companies also have to invest right like we have to I think one of the other things we learned last year is like as leaders we have to be very empathetic um, you know I now start every meeting with how's everybody feeling how's your day going just so simple questions yeah. that seem very trivial mean a lot to people to all of us right like the fact that you asked me, how are you feeling today? It was the first thing we said to each other when we got on this call. Those things matter. And I hope those things stay, right, as permanent things. So companies also have to in, invest in their employees' wellness, in their, in their employees' mental wellness, um, in addition to just making sure they can be productive. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen a crazy evolution of those types of ideas um, in the last you know, 10 to 20 years in terms of how it's becoming so top of mind. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the partnership that we're doing with Fable is it's a really nice balance of those two things is, you know, a company can basically set up a stipend and give employees some level of flexibility around learning and development or health and wellness. But then there is certain level of accountability and autonomy for the employee or the team member to go out and say, okay, I'm going to invest this in a digital book club. Right. Um yeah, so it's 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 sort of the the best of both worlds. I've never really asked this, but it's 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 sort of top of mind because you were talking about visiting your son in LA. Um, I'm curious um, how your business and leadership experience um, impacted your parenting philosophy mm. and like maybe your your role as a you know matriarch within your own family. Um, because I'm sure those two things are, are connected and it's something that women also have to straddle and balance and, and men have to balance these days. And, and that's also becoming more okay, um, is as we are all working from home to kind of like interweave between work and life. I mean, that's a great question. Yeah, no one's asked me that, but definitely, <laughs> right? Like, uh, I have this philosophy that we all have one life, right? Like we don't have our work life and a family life. We have one life and in our life, we have work, family, our community, ourselves. Um, and I'm a big believer that those lines are blurring, right? Like it is sort of like we're working from home, but even before, and I think this was something that I believed in right from the beginning. And so when my son was young, I always made sure I spoke with him about my work, what my job was, which company I was working for, because I used to travel a lot when my uh, son was a baby. And, uh, and a toddler and break my heart every time I had to leave him and go on a business trip somewhere. 
and he would cry and I would cry and it was like this big drama. And, and, and so I quickly realized I have to turn this around and make it some kind of a fun experience. I would always tell him where I was going and you know, I would do a lot of international travel at the time. Um, we would go explore that country and, and make it really part of our lives. And so I was always a big believer in making work part of your life, making sure your children understand what you're doing. And you know, it reflects your parenting skills too. I also, I think was a big believer that my son had to be independent. He didn't have to depend on me to go get his own food because I would work late. And so I think I raised him to be very independent in doing those sorts of things. Like he's very capable of getting his own lunch, fixing lunch for all of us, dinner, whoever was home did it. And it wasn't like set rules that you did this, I did this. Um, I think there were certain kinds of things that I did uh, with my parenting that was, because I was a working parent, um, I think being active and involving, we read together. I think my son is a writer actually, as it so happens. Um, and so stories were a big, big part of our family, even growing up, because through stories, I felt I, we could discuss things like tough things that we couldn't talk about maybe, um, such as inequality in society. I, you know, I, I, I was an immigrant. I came to this country as an immigrant from India. I wanted him to understand the culture of his heritage. You know, I wanted to, him to read stories about India. Um, and, and although he was born here and was growing up here. I think there are all these things that as a parent that you do um, and as working parents, we can do right to make our children um, have a work ethic, even as they're growing up and, and realize that, uh, you know, when you have both parents that work, you have a bigger responsibility and a bigger role to play in the family. Um, mm. So, yeah, I love that. Um Another sort of question I haven't asked, but it's sort of prompting me because of, you know, that you're so well read and and have and you know talk a lot about the power of stories um you know for me one of the 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 big stories um that has impacted sort of how i think about my own ethics and values is the story that uh my principal in elementary school used to talk about of you know this this kid that every time he would um hurt someone at school um he would go and have to put a nail in the mm. wall and, um, you know, he and then he would go and apologize. And he was every time he apologized, he was able to he was allowed to take the, the nail out of the wall. Um, but, you know, the 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 lesson that his the father taught the son was, you know, look at this, like, even if you apologize um, for what you said, you take the nails out, the holes are still there. Yeah. So, like, be really conscientious and impeccable with your word. Um, are there any stories like that that have like stuck out to you that you've either taught your son or that uh, that sort of have found their way back in terms of affecting how you operate as a human being, how you lead, how you treat people? Yeah, I mean, very fun. It's very funny. Yeah, I often tell this story to everyone. And I used to tell this story. The and same I one? Not this one, no. Yeah. It's, but like you say, like I don't remember yeah. the origin of the story. It's, it's similar in the sense that this is a story of somebody. The story goes like this, and I'll make it very brief. You know, this person yeah. is praying, and they're praying to God, and they pray, and then so God shows up and says, "Okay, what would you like as a boon?" And the person says, "You know, I have all these troubles, and I want you to uh, take my troubles away and and like give me a trouble-free life." And uh, so, so, so God, quote unquote, says that, okay, great, I'll give you a bag, you put all your troubles in, in this bag, and you carry it to this place. And there you will find a bunch of other bags. And you know, so you're, I'll give you the boon where you have to exchange your bag for another bag, you know, so you don't know what's going to be in that bag, and you can pick that up. And, you know, hopefully, it will be trouble free. And so this person puts, quote unquote, all their troubles in this bag, and they go carry it to this place where he was told to go. And he then hesitates because he realizes there's many, many bags out there. And, you know, some are small bags, some are big bags. Um, and so he suddenly realizes that God, quote unquote, or whoever this person was that appeared in front of them was a... Uh, testing them and the moral of the story is look everybody has a bag and in that bag we all have our troubles and so if you want to exchange this for something you don't know what you're going to get right like so yeah sort of looking at like as a trouble that you want to give away and have like no bag at all 
um, maybe be just be satisfied with what you have and figure out how to live. So this is a story I used to always like tell my son, but I even tell now to my nieces and others when they complain about like, oh, my life is so hard. I'm so burnt out. My work is this, my, my job is that. I always like tell them, remember that story about the bags thing. And I actually tell myself that too some days. Um, I think we all, all, all think somebody other, other people's lives are simpler and we realize no one's life is simple. Life is hard and we just kind of yeah. have to be content with what we have and make the best out of it and work hard to make, make a great life, right? Yeah, um, well, that's what social media does. It like it just shows us the highlight reel. And that's I love that story because it's it's a nice uh, way to sort of illustrate when there's any layer of jealousy. Like you can't just pick and choose the best parts of someone else's life exactly. without taking the shadow and the darkness um, and the struggle that, uh, you know, the suffering that's there as well. Um, Padma, this has been so awesome. I'd love to just end with maybe something, uh, you know, a question around just like, what are you most excited about as you think about the next year or few years of building Fable um, and all the yeah. other, you know, maybe tailwinds that are happening within wellness and other sort of industry innovation? Um, what are you most excited about right now? Yeah, I, I'm I'm super excited about Fable. I think there's just we're on to something. Uh, we're building great communities. Uh, I think it's it's so moving to see people as they're reading share how it's changing. So you know, there's many many free clubs people can join, uh, and these communities are growing. We have a lot of YA book clubs, and so seeing young people read and talk about how this is a safe place where they feel they can discuss anything. I think there's just so much more we could do there. So mm -hmm. of course, I'm super excited about that. More broadly, I think if I look at the industry in general, I'm excited about two movements that I'm seeing happening. I think this, this movement about hybrid work team and giving people the flexibility in the future of work for being anywhere and working, I think is a really a good one, right? Like giving you the flexibility. If you want to come to office, great. Like come to your office and work in your office. But you can't. If you can't, that's okay. You can still be working from anywhere. I think now it's becoming more mainstream and I'm super excited about it. Because like, when I was working 10 years ago, this was a no-no in the industry. Like we were afraid if we stayed home, even when we were sick, we wouldn't stay home. Like we were still wow. sure to work. It was so inflexible, the workforce, uh, workplace at that time. So I think this flexible workplace and this concept of hybrid work, I'm super excited about. And the movement more broadly on making mental wellness. And as you said, what June is doing, right? Like giving employees the freedom to choose and giving companies uh, a way to reward their employees and take care of their employees. I, I'm excited about that movement as well, where companies are concerned more broadly uh, about making their employees better human beings than just just squeezing productivity out of us. Uh, I think those two things I'm uh, super excited about. Thank you. Yeah, the, our lives are so dynamic and we need things at uh, new, new, different things at different times. So um, the, those combinations of those trends together, along with what Fable is building, it, it really me, it really connects to all of those. Um, I'm so grateful that you took the time. I look forward to continuing this hopefully in person um, next time. And um, yeah, for, for those out there that haven't heard of Fable, you now have and you've met Padma. Uh, please go check them out. And join one of their book clubs and read. Awesome. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye.